Welcome to the show. You're listening to The Ecosystem, where we talk with the world's most exceptional entrepreneurs, investors, and emerging growth companies who are all making a difference in the world. The purpose is to be educated, spark a thought, and understand how the ecosystem all work together. All of this brought to you by the team at Fund. This is your host, RJ Pahura. My guest today is Lisa Magill. Lisa is the co-founder and COO of Alaria. She passionately tackles real-world problems with innovative and impactful solutions. After several years in the financial services industry, Lisa gained extensive entrepreneurial experience holding key positions on the founding teams of funded and acquired technology startups. Over the years, she's been recognized for her commitment to community and the impact of her efforts focused on mentorship, education, and creating opportunities for women. Currently, she leverages her passions and expertise to help take the guesswork out of diversity and inclusion as a co-founder and COO of Alaria. For more information, check out fundecosystem.com. Without further ado, let's give it up for Lisa. Lisa, welcome to the show and welcome back uh, to Chicago. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, what, uh, what brings you in today? What well, brings you back to Chicago, I should say. Back to Chicago, yeah. I'm in the process of relocating from Atlanta to Chicago. Uh, happy to be back. It's been just a couple of days, but this is, I guess, my first stop. Yeah, Atlanta's a, a big difference uh, here than Chicago, It doesn't right? get cold. <laughs> <laughs> Hot Atlanta. I love it. Um, well, you spent some time, I think, uh, uh, you originated from Chicago. Is that safe to say? Uh, I spent about seven years in Chicago, okay. like in my 20s, so it's probably the place I would consider home. Okay. But and then moved to Los Angeles for about two and a half years and then Atlanta for about two. Okay. What yeah. brought you to LA? Uh, this is all actually a result of my husband's job relocating him. And luckily just within startup space and my career, I was able to kind of follow along with that and work from home. So yeah. Very different, but uh, love, love California. One of my favorites. It was an interesting experience. <laughs> I... And then to Atlanta. Yeah. Which um, is a vibrant startup community. And yeah. I honestly, the day I heard we were moving to Atlanta, I was in tears. I, I was so upset. I was like, oh, of all places, why are we moving to Atlanta? Uh, and it was a delightful surprise. I ended up loving it. It's such a great city. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So were you doing some of the same pieces of work? Um, I know today we're going to talk a little bit about diversity, inclusion, um, research, implementing it in organizations. Um, did you do some of the same work throughout from Chicago to LA to Atlanta? Well, from Chicago, I kept my actual position with um, a tech startup that was based here at Point Drive for a couple of months when I moved to Los Angeles. I kind of uh, transitioned after that, started a company called Equity Directory that was helping entrepreneurs uh, find individuals that were willing to work in exchange for equity. And then I went on a path where I was really trying to figure out how to get more into the social impact space. And so I uh, secured a fellowship through a program called Moving Worlds, which was really neat. It was a six month program where we're all learning together around how to drive impact and like design thinking and things of this nature, uh, which landed me in Rwanda for about two months. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was it was kind of random, but I ended up volunteering uh with a accelerator program there and mentoring 16 entrepreneurs and helping them raise capital. Uh, and it was one of the most empowering and enlightening experiences I've had in a really long time. And so after that, I, I kind of recommitted myself to only creating businesses or focusing on solutions that are going to make a difference in the world. And uh, I luckily met my current co-founder shortly after that. And uh, so here we are. It's a big topic right now. Yeah. Um, social impact. Social impact. Um, and is that currently you're the co-founder and COO of Illyria? I am. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit more about your background um, and then we'll lead back into how you got into uh, Illyria? Sure. So I, I guess my background beyond what I just explained was actually in finance. I started in finance, uh, had a bunch of you know licenses and worked with day traders, but still even at that time, I was a software person. I was selling people on the idea of trading on our software. I didn't realize that I was kind of in a tech startup at the time, but I was. It was uh, a technology company that had developed a tool that allowed everyday people to you know, trade on direct access routes, which at the time sounded really cool. And we got acquired uh, for our technology. And then we got bought out again. And it's like now in hindsight, I'm like, I've literally been doing this my whole career, just in different ways and thinking of it in different ways. But stepped into tech startups um, more officially in about 2010. Um, helped with uh, the founding and sales and marketing of a company called Fipex that sold a kind of a a data management tool for financial services companies. 
And then uh, same thing with uh, a sales tool called Pipe um, Pipe Drive that uh, got acquired by LinkedIn. Yep. And then yep. here we are through the through the LA phase um, and Atlanta phase, and now Alaria focuses more on solutions and research that are related to diversity and inclusion. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Definitely want to get back more into that. Um, sure. It's a hot topic right now as well yeah. as social impact. Um, what, uh, so as far as community, um, efforts, um, you know, being in Chicago for uh, 13 years now myself and, um, previously knowing you, I think from a different life, yeah. um, you were, uh, really a staple of, you know, women in business, women in entrepreneurship, um, here in the Chicagoland area. I think, um, even in the Midwest, um, a Thank lot you. of people were, yeah, absolutely following you. Um, so, you know, as far as like the community efforts, what, what got that going for you? How did you, how did you get into this? Um, um, excluding Illyria for now. Sure. Um, Of course. What what was the driver behind that? Um, what does it mean to you? Um, I think that throughout my entire career, I've always kind of, um, ended up for whatever reason in rooms full of men and been one of the youngest and one of the only women in the room often throughout my career. And I didn't really understand or know how to navigate that in the financial services world. But when I stepped into tech startups, I, I think I took a little more initiative. I was like, I need, I need mentors. I need to be surrounded by entrepreneurs who can tell me, you know, what is right and wrong. Am I, you know, negotiating the right terms? You know, how should I focus this business as I'm trying to scale it? And I had a hard time finding female entrepreneurs in Chicago at the time. And so I got lucky. Um, you know, I did meet Nicole Yeri, who was the founder of Miss Tech, kind of helped her. Um, and then for a number of years while running tech startups, we also built that community. And, you know, as you mentioned, it became um, kind of a go-to community for women in technology and entrepreneurship in the area because we created programming and networking events and the mentorship that really young entrepreneurs need to be able to get past those initial hurdles on their own. Um, and it was something that was very important to me because I felt that I needed it. Yeah. Um, but I realized very quickly that I wasn't the only one. Right. Right. Yeah. How did, uh, how long did it take to kind of grow that, um, initiative and you know, what, what, uh, what are some of the key things that you saw as a result of it? Yeah, it started as, you know, Nicole started as a Facebook group, right? So when you say like, how long did it take? It's like it was an ever evolving project and creature, right? So it started as a community, whereas, you know, any other you meet up every you you go from like online communities to like face to face communities. And then we're like creating programming, creating um, educational content, um, helping with mentor matching. So it just kind of evolved based on the needs of the community and the size of the community. Uh, But that was a, you know, four to five year you know, endeavor that yeah. continue to take shape yeah. and evolve based on the needs of women, but the, based on the needs of the community as well. Because as entrepreneurship grew here in Chicago, the needs were different. Yeah. What did you see as some of the biggest things, um, you know, that, that were takeaways um, that, that, that needed to happen and, and change in the space? I think one is it's always just reassuring to know that you're not in it alone and to have that sounding board when you have moments of conflict or confusion. But the biggest thing that we noticed was that the women in our community were having a hard time raising capital. And so uh, we kind of towards the end focused our energies and efforts on how do we remove the barriers, whether they're internal, you know, perception issues or external community issues. Uh, how do we take all of that down and help get women in front of more investors and with the right content and with the right business models and the right pitch decks so that, you know, we're increasing the odds of them securing capital. And so towards the end, that's really where it was focused um, is just building their confidence, preparing them, you know, over preparing their their um, questions and answers that they're going to get you know hit with in those meetings and making sure that they had all of the uh, documentation they needed to potentially land funding. Yeah. Uh, w- was there a common theme aside from funding, um, either in the industries or <clears throat> focus that um, these women entrepreneurs were were trying to build their businesses? I, you know, having left Chicago, yeah. um, it gives you a different perspective. Yeah. I realize now how focused we are on B two B, okay, uh, and how in Chicago, yeah, okay. Exactly. It. Uh, it's a huge B2B. And so I think that like a lot of what I now realize is a lot of the um, B2C ideas just didn't get the same support. And no, it was kind of like everyone assumed they were side hustles and like wouldn't expect them to grow bigger. And so I think it was a lot harder for B2C entrepreneurs because the B2B model was just something that Chicago 
gets. Yeah. Uh, and so in hindsight, um, I'm also a B2B person. So it was probably maybe like a little bit of like I self-perpetuated some of that. But uh, I think that B2B businesses uh, are phenomenal businesses, but there there should have been more space and um, help for B2C businesses yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. And so you mentioned the capital thing. Um, if I remember correctly, I think I saw a statistic. It was like less than 3% of um, women and minority-led companies are venture-funded um, in like 2018. So it's probably a year old at this point. Yeah. Um, I, again, don't don't have that uh, stat in front of me, <laughs> but um, that was obviously yeah. a uh, pain point and struck a nerve for, for you guys. And, and it sounds like it's continued on to yeah. this day. Um, I feel like there's definitely been an increase, at least, you know, from my optics, what I'm seeing um, in venture funding for women led companies. Yeah. Um, in some ways, I almost feel like they do have an advantage, yeah. um, just to be very honest. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts now, um, you know, touring different parts of the country uh, <laughs> or living in different parts yeah. of the country and, and uh, seeing what else is out there? I think uh, the statistics are always jarring, right? And I, a few that kind of stick in my mind, you know, similar to one that you referenced, I just saw one that was like, oh, women took the biggest percentage of capital in, you know, 2019 than any year before, but it's at 2.8%. Right. And it was like, pop the bottle. So it was like they, a 0. 0.06% increase, right? <laughs> right? It was like a 2% increase yeah. or something, but it's still just 2.8%, right. right? So it's like, yeah, like put the cork back in the champagne bottle as I right. think what the tweet got a said. Lot of work to do. Yeah, it's, we have a long way to go. Uh, and uh, the, you know, I think recently also I saw a statistic where it was something like women took in, in previously, maybe this was 2018, like Juul, the one company took more capital than all women and minority entrepreneurs that year. So it's like this one company was able to do that, right? So there's all these different ways of looking at it, but no matter what, the data shows that we have work to do uh, and that whether it's a combination of the businesses that women are creating, a combination of biases that exist in both, you know, how we go about creating entrepreneurs and, you know, how they see themselves in terms of the scale of their organization, but also personal biases that exist in the investors. Right. It's all complicated and we all have a piece and a responsibility to improve it. Yeah. So aside from venture funding, is there like one other main thing that, um, you know, you found as a real focal point that you guys wanted to change? Well, I think more and more, uh, what we have to realize is like venture funding doesn't mean successful business. And so yeah. Companies Good should point. be able to build a business without the expectation or the need or the the feeling that they're not successful if they don't raise capital because yeah. there are so many models and nowadays you just you just don't need it uh, in some models obviously there's there's exceptions but uh, I'm I'm getting tired of the story that or even just the idea that all of the press and all of the focus and all of the celebrity you know um, kind of like spin on our space is is given to those that raise the most capital. And yeah. it's like those models, a lot of times the, the companies that are even raising the most money and getting acquired don't even have actual business models. They're not right. profitable. Right. And so now I'm really trying to focus on pointing entrepreneurs to how do you make this scalable yeah. and profitable and how do you get it to pay for itself? Build, so sustain, that it, grow. Yeah. yeah. Like if you, if you can pay yourself and you no longer have a boss, like that is a success story. Right. Um, and it should be seen that way and it should be celebrated. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, nothing wrong with building a business that makes money. Yeah. Um, that uh, you can be happy with and right. maybe not have shareholders to report to, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, it wouldn't be all that bad. Um, so cool. So that that actually brings up a good point, I think, as it relates to like DEI. Um, you are big in that space. And um, I think for some of the listeners, you know, I'd love to know your definition of DEI. Um, and you know, then maybe how you're currently implementing it in, um, your business and talking through that as well. Sure. Uh, so just thinking of diversity, equity, and inclusion, as you're saying, DEI, um, the way that we think about it is, is the fact that, you know, a lot of times companies or press or just the way that we talk about diversity and inclusion, they get lumped together as like one idea. And we're really working to separate them. Uh, it's it's one thing to track diversity metrics, representation metrics, yeah. but really that work was based on legal obligation 
you know, yeah. companies started tracking that data for um, legal purposes. They started creating the the first like unconscious bias trainings based on, you know, avoiding discrimination lawsuits. Like all of the intention behind initial diversity work is just not the same as it is today. And so we're really focused on driving inclusion and equality and equity. Um, and so in our organization, when we're thinking of what needs to happen, how can companies truly prioritize diversity and inclusion, we're literally telling them, Yes, collect the like the diversity demographic metrics, but that's not how you prioritize the work. The work is really focused on inclusion because you don't maintain, you don't um, retain, you don't deserve yep. diverse talent if you can't bring them in and provide them, you know, um, a work culture and environment whereas they feel supported and enjoy their day to day basis uh, and feel like they have learning and growth opportunities and. Um, you know, are, are treated equally. And yeah. so we really focus everyone on inclusion. And maybe the unique aspect of that is that we help uh, companies measure inclusion, which allows them to kind of shift a little bit away from diversity, look at inclusion and truly understand how it links to their business performance metrics and can be used as um, a competitive advantage or like a strategy that can actually drive them to being a bit a better business. What, how would you define um, in- inclusion? So Inclusion to me is the the act of like the things that you do to make people feel like they um, belong. Yeah. Um, I think of it in the context of what's opposite of inclusive, the opposite of inclusion as exclusion, right? So if there are any things that are happening, whether they're interactions or policies or procedures that are making people feel like they're excluded, that is what we're working against. I think it's a really interesting point how you separate um, diversity um, and the inclusion part of diversity. It's one thing, as you said, to have the diversity. It's another thing to make them feel inclusive. Yeah. Um, what What are some of the um, things that you guys are implementing to, you know, change that? So we we think of inclusion when when we're talking of like how to measure it, how to think of it, how to um, kind of rate how you're doing an inclusion with a framework that we call the categories of inclusion. Okay. I, that's only helpful because it helps you realize where you can focus your efforts. And so those categories typically are things like work-life balance, um, access to, um, it's just access, so like access to like your peers, access to your uh, management, access to information, things like learning and growth opportunities, benefits and pay, um, microaggressions, you know, things like this. So it's, it's a list of things that basically allow organizations and individuals to think of how they are being included and excluded in the context of a workplace. And so uh, you can create strategies uh, to make sure that things are equal and inclusive under each of those umbrellas. And so, you know, if it's work-life balance, you know, that's one that comes up a lot these days. Flexibility. I'm sure. sure. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, it's really just being considerate and under and representing your values as an organization and allowing people to do their best work. So, you know, simple things that you just don't think of, you know, maybe because they don't apply to you, but things like, oh, do you have a meeting at 8 a.m. every morning? Is that really hard for the mother of two who has to drop her kids off at school? You know, that's not an inclusive practice that allows people to be um, involved and like arrive in the same context as everyone else. And so just kind of putting thought through little things like that makes a huge difference. Um, And so we just reflectively analyze based on those categories ourselves and, and externally with our customers. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, do you see any big markers? Um, I know you mentioned like, you know, time, work-life balance, um, anything else as it relates to inclusion that, you know, is the, the glowing thing that's, uh, that's, that's pointing out right now. Well, it's, it's going to be equal pay. Yeah. Um, is, is the other just really big one is the fact that and I think there's a, a growing conversation around equal pay and the transparency around pay. Okay. Uh, and that applies, you know, across the, the scale of like gender, but also um, looking at intersectionality, what we're finding is just very consistently, even companies that are investing in uh, building a more inclusive environment are typically starting with gender and not looking beyond it. And so uh, really making sure that you're diving deep into how equitably you're paying and yeah. um, promoting everyone. So it might be ignorant of me to say, but it's that's still an issue. Absolutely. From what you're seeing. Yeah. Is it more an issue at the SMB, small, medium business space, or uh, uh, mid-level or enterprise? 
I mean, across the board, okay. it's, I mean, there was just a study that was done on, uh, I think they were UK based banks, but it was like, basically, the financial services industry is the worst um, in terms of pay equity and transparency. Yeah. Um, and at least in that study from the UK, and very similar results here in the United States, um, we have less data around um, small businesses and what they pay people, the larger businesses are starting to be held accountable. Uh, they're, they're, employees and their investors are demanding transparency and you see a greater impact when they adjust and so you have CEOs um, like LinkedIn recently did a huge you know overhaul where they looked and they said you know not only have we prioritized equal pay but we're having to every time we acquire a new company like reanalyze because uh, people are coming in and they're yeah. they're getting paid at a different rate based on their old company and so they're proactively having to always look at that data it's not something you can do once and be done yeah, yeah. it's like they have to um get more people in hr or talent and diversity leaders i suppose right right um, but like transparency helps a lot right so if you're willing to be transparent around it uh, there, it requires less people doing the research and trying to uncover the numbers, yeah. right? Because then they're just out there and it's really obvious when somebody's not paid the same. Yeah. Um, what about um, the diversity and uh, equity piece? Um, and, you know, how would you define each of those? And, you know, how are you implementing some of those in, in your day-to-day -day work life? So when I, separately from everything we've talked about, I think the biggest focus is on recruiting. Okay. Uh, so if you're looking to build a team or scale a team, that's really where you, the first point, whereas which founders or business leaders go wrong, right? So if you're recruiting in a very biased way, yeah. uh, maybe recruiting from your personal peer network or requiring referrals, things like that are just like innately bias. And so you're, you're limiting the access and the ability for everyone to participate equally. Very and so interesting that you said being, the, the word bias, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's really, it, it takes a lot of personal awareness to realize that sometimes when we're just trying to make our job easier, we're actually creating barriers for other people. Yeah. And that's just a place where consistently across businesses at all sizes, we're seeing that you can easily and very quickly and without a lot of investment change um, who you're hiring, who's applying for jobs. Um, but then that trickles into like the, the interview process, just making sure you're not being uh, discriminatory or biased within the interview processes uh, and making sure that you're hiring people who are the best person for the job and that you're using the right criteria to analyze that. And so just a little of perspective and analysis on that process can really change who's coming into your organization, which changes your diversity metrics, which changes your ability to be a truly diverse and inclusive uh, company. So it's hard enough finding good talent. Um, you know, uh, I mean, here, you know, yeah. We would hire anyone as long as they have uh, the right attributes um, can effectively do the job. And, um, you know, I think when you talk about having these initiatives in the business, whether you're a small or medium sized business, how do you how do you go about implementing those? And what are some of the methods that you're you know, teaching organizations to, to do so? Yeah. So it's interesting because. When we think of what we need from someone yeah. that we're hiring, a lot of times the things, the criteria that you would write in a job description just aren't necessary. So things like, do you actually need somebody with a degree? You know, and it's, it seems like a default or an easy thing to just like rule out people who don't have a degree, but like it's very, that's like- A lot of the large, large organizations are going away from it, right? They are, yeah, and thankfully. But it's, it's just those things like, that's just one example, but a lot of times the things that we think of are default on a job posting just aren't actually a requirement for them to be able to do, do the job and to do it well. And so- Looking at how you're writing job postings um, goes a long way. So you can say, you know, look at each criteria, each bullet point and say, do I actually need them to have a degree? Do they actually need 10 years experience? Do they actually need to have worked in this industry? Do they need to know this tool? Or is that something I can teach them in a day? Yeah. You know, and a lot of times That's you'll find point. that we put these things that are like wish lists on a job posting, but the way that minorities and women read that is that it's a requirement and they're not going to apply. And so we have to be careful about one, removing all gendered language from the job posting, okay. removing all unnecessary requirements and really allowing people to show up and apply, getting a broader uh, number of applicants and then looking for people who are the best fit, who aren't, um, you know, a culture fit is like the wrong would do it, but like who can add to the organization. Right, right. Yeah. Because you are balancing culture, you're balancing talent, 
um, skills, right? Like it's, it's a lot. It is a lot, but it should always be focused on, I'm hiring this person to do a job and what do they actually need to do that job? Right. Um, and a lot of times what happens is, you know, you hire someone to do, let's say coding, you know, it's like they're a developer, but like you're actually without saying it, you're expecting them to do these other handful of things. You're expecting them to, you know, chime in on design. You're expecting them to have awareness of product management or, you know, all of these things. A lot of times, particularly with small businesses, we put more hats on them than they originally got hired for. And so we just need to be very clear about that. But then think of like, what did I actually hire this person to do and what do they need to be able to do that job and trying to remove the noise? Yeah. So for some of the small to medium sized businesses, um, how do you recommend that they go about making sure that, you know, DEI is part of their everyday, right? Like that's, um, it's something I think even we struggle with here. Um, although we have men and women both, um, you know, we don't have one person per se in charge of DEI. Um, you know, how would you suggest going about that for these smaller companies? Um, yeah. you know, like we're a 12 person team. So it's like, you know, and even a, a 25 or 50 person company, um, you know, maybe they can't afford to have someone, um, on staff to do so. Is it an outsourced HR person? Um, you know, maybe that's where they bring you in. <laughs> <laughs> they could bring me in. I will definitely point them in the right direction. But, uh, to answer your question, I love the question. It's, if I was to ask you the same thing about, well, I can't afford a sales guy or woman, Ooh. who do I, Steve. who's the salesperson? Yes. And it's always the founder. Yes. The founder is the salesperson Absolutely. until you can aff- afford to buy a sales, buy, <laughs> pay Absolutely. a sales for a person. Um, so it's the same thing. It's, you know, you know you're know, you going to have a culture, whether you create one intentionally or not. Yes. You're going to have policies. You're going to have template job postings. It's just that stuff happens and it's going to be created. And so you just have to be intentional about prioritizing diversity and inclusion as a small team and and showing that as the team scales up to being a you know mid-sized company um, that happens by having it built into the values of your organization okay. and having leaders founders make sure that it's seen and heard uh, and that's through things like inclusive language when they're talking to the team and like all hands meetings that's through um awareness of how they're communicating around holidays it's the simple things that make it very clear that they're considerate of and um, trying to drive an inclusive environment and it's 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 not done you know easily it's something that like founders and business leaders have to work at like you know even me right now in a diversity and inclusion company and having worked in the you know women empowerment space for years yes i still am always learning right right the way that I talk, the things that are, you know, um, I build awareness around every single day learning. Right. And and then, so you have to just be not afraid to make mistakes as a business founder in that space. I think a lot of it is that as well. They'll just like put it on the back burner because they're not comfortable with it. They're they're worried that they need to over research it and like start it with this massive plan. And it's, it's really just in your day-to-day interactions where it, where it comes to life. And so, um, yeah, just to reiterate, it has to be a part of your values it has to come from the top. It should start when you're small and uh, just know that you're going to mess it up along the way, but yeah. that's okay. I love that. I mean, because it is a top-down approach, right? Always, if yeah. It's, if it's not, then it's not important to the employees. So. Some of the biggest companies in the United States right now have hired an HR person, a d- diversity and inclusion officer in the last three years. I think it was like 46% of the uh, S&P D&I officers were hired in the last three years. It's wow. a new position. It's growing, right? But the problem is if you aren't giving those executives, and this is obviously very different than like a small business, but just to give you an idea of like small, medium, large, we're still seeing the same hurdles. Yeah. These executives are brought into these organizations right. with this title saying, change the way that we work, prioritize diversity and inclusion. However, they're put under the HR umbrella and they're not given the data they need. They're not given the power they need. They're not given the ability to enact change. So they're not able to make progress. Right. And that's not the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, when, when did this become so important to you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> struck a nerve there. <laughs> uh, I think, I think it's evolved, right? Okay. So I, uh, I think that my earliest relationship with understanding that I was kind of excluded was in finance just okay. because I was a 22 year old you know, manager working my way by the time I was 25, you know, I'm a director level reporting to the CEO with like teams of mostly men that are 
on average double my age, right? And yeah. so I think I felt what that was like um, through my first career and then saw it again when I stepped into tech and then realized that I had the ability to help other people in that scenario. And so I think it just kind of like grew as this like personal experience um, and reflection and the way that I, I guess, invested my own time into that space has just evolved. And, you know, yeah. it started as just like mentoring or being a part of, you know, communities. And then it became, you know, developing and working on this tech and helping create content and, you know, programs to drive change to now, you know, wanting to be a social impact organization, create solutions that are going to drive, you know, a better world. And then realizing that this can all happen in the same space where I'm removing barriers through technology and education um, for women and underrepresented, you know, talent throughout the world now. And so um, I just got lucky, I think. That's awesome. <laughs> but my personal experience kind of lights the fire. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So then that led you into your current role at Alaria. Yep. Um, and definitely want to talk about that. But um, you guys have had some big success with like funding rounds and some other I don't know if it's a grant or something that um, you received in support with the Coffin Foundation and uh, the Minority Business Development Agency. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your role um, at Alaria? I think we've kind of built everyone up to what you do now um, and, you know, sort of the background as to how you got there. Um, I'd love to know more about the company and um, then obviously get into some of the details about like the Kaufman thing and the initiatives yeah. that you're deploying, you know, nationally. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, I guess, storyline, but a few things matter uh, in terms of the company and, and how we're working and, and definitely would love to share a little bit more about those grants that we're working on in the yeah. entrepreneurship space. Uh, initially, I was hired actually to do product management and development for Alaria. Okay. Uh, and I kind of like grew into... Now, what a, is Alaria? I'm sorry. So no. Alaria oh. is the for-profit company um, that is focused on taking the guesswork out of diversity and inclusion. Okay. And we do that by providing uh, frameworks and tools and solutions that help companies understand how to quantify and measure their progress against inclusion uh, or with inclusion. So the reason that matters and why I say for profit is because we also have a nonprofit uh, called ARC. And at ARC, we uh, take these frameworks, this methodology, um, Paulo Gaudiano, who's the uh, founder and the, my business partner, uh, has a background in complexity science. And so he combines complexity science and behavioral science and software simulations to um, simulate what's going on in organizations with individuals and to understand how to create better interventions to cause change. And so we use this approach in research at the nonprofit side, and then we take what we learn at the nonprofit through these projects and develop frameworks and tools at the for-profit. So, and so doing it at a macro level and then sort of going down to the employee yeah. level through technology and through hands-on Yeah, Yes, exactly. Through, so okay. a lot of what we do requires education. Okay. You know, uh, it's, it's a matter of getting everyone on the same page about how to think of diversity and inclusion, how to see that it it links to your business performance metrics, that it's not just a fuzzy feel good um, experience, that what it is is actually driving your company to be a better organization, empowering your employees to be more satisfied, to be more productive, to be more innovative, to be more loyal, and ultimately driving revenue for your organization yeah. if you're doing it right. So, uh, you know, on at Alaria, we're focused on the workforce and how to drive inclusion in companies. Yeah. On the nonprofit side, we're looking at more ecosystem stuff. We're saying, bigger picture, how can we drive change in communities out in the world? Yeah. Yep. So from that perspective, the research side is interesting too, because, um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Kaufman, yeah. um, and, and the grant that you guys had received there. Um, they're a huge research firm, right? Um, what type of, is it, is it research solely based on DEI and how it relates to these organizations? And then you know, how did that come about with the whole Kaufman thing? I think um, it's very interesting. Kaufman Foundation is the largest entrepreneurial foundation in the world. Um, and it's interesting that you guys are, you know, yeah. partnered with them. Yeah, we're, um, we're excited the to be. from them, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the nonprofit that we've created has been around for a year. And so within one year, we've been able to secure grants with the Minority Business Development Agency and with Kaufman, which okay. is pretty incredible. Both. Yes. Yes. And so uh, the two projects are kind of related because they happen to both be looking at the entrepreneurship ecosystem, okay. whereas 
what our nonprofit focuses on is diversity and inclusion research, but it doesn't have to be in that space. It just so happens that our first two big grants are in that space. Okay. I'm super excited about that because that's my background, my jam, all about it. You know, it's worlds collide. Uh, and I can share personal experiences and, you know, go into entrepreneurial communities with, with like a network, right? But the work itself is both trying to understand uh, what is happening with entrepreneurs between the, fa- the moment that they have an idea and the moment where they become a success or failure. We have a lot of data around the number of companies that are created. We have a lot of data around who gets funding and we have a lot of data around the companies that are successful, how big are they and how much revenue are they creating? Yeah. But there's this huge gap in terms of what's happening when, co- when entrepreneurs create a business, have an idea, what happens to the, you know, between that moment and the moment of when they either decide to or not to get funding. And you know, that journey looks different for different industries. That journey looks different for people in different locations. Um, but what we're trying to understand is does that journey look different based on my race or based on my gender or my sexual orientation. And that data doesn't exist. And so we've mapped out a survey and visualizations to help uh, get that insight uh, that hopes to drive policymaking and program creation to be more inclusive yeah. in that space. Yeah. So you mentioned like program creation. Um, who is your ideal target? Um, is it um, these... DEI officers of companies? Is it program managers? Yeah, it's really accelerators and like entrepreneurial leadership communities. So that could be, you know, standalone accelerators that could be within a a college or university system. That could be, um, you know, a government driven program. Doesn't matter to us, but if you're driving growth in entrepreneurship, we want to make sure that you're creating the right support system. Okay. So like, I think Techstars just, they have, I don't know if they just hired, I think they've had yep. a uh, diversity and inclusion um, officer, or right. VP. Uh, so this is for maybe them or yeah. another program manager. It is. So what will happen is they can look at, let's say that they're community participates and uh, we collect surveys. So we capture the entrepreneurial journey of the entrepreneurs within the Techstars program. They can then say, show me the experience of an entrepreneur in our Atlanta program and compare that to the entrepreneurs in the Chicago program. Or they can say, show me how the entrepreneurial journey forms prior to funding for Techstars entrepreneurs and compare that to the average 30 year old white male in the United States who starts a company. And so they're able to take that data and map out the journeys and see how they differ and how they can create programs to support or to meet entrepreneurs where they are to get them where the rest of the entrepreneurs that they're funding currently exist. Uh, And we're, you know, worth mentioning. So the Kauffman foundation grant takes all of that information, but it's, it's actually a program where we're coming into those organizations, the accelerators, the entrepreneurial support organizations, communities, networking, co-working spaces, these kinds of things and providing a workshop that is meant to educate founders uh, around why they need to focus on diversity and inclusion from day one. And and we do that in a number of ways, but it's a lot of what we've already discussed. It's, it's really just explaining what diversity and inclusion means in an organization, how it can be used as a competitive advantage, and how they can think of it as linking to their business performance metrics, uh, and, and really trying to encourage them not to wait until they're big enough to hire somebody, yeah, but to yeah. invest in it early. Start early. Yeah. Um, so is this something that you continually do with these organizations? Yeah. Um, or is it uh, the main portion is done at the front and then continually monitored? How does that? It's a great question. So we just started the Kaufman Workshop um, program in September. Okay. And initially we envisioned it to be a one workshop where we just drop in and you know change the world in that 60 minutes. But that's not the reality. Um, but what we're aiming to do is come in and give that initial workshop, provide supplemental resources. So those are videos, links to other tools and solutions that can help them along their journey. Uh, But then we're also checking in with them every six months to say, who have you hired? Have you used any of our tools? How can we be more helpful? Um, Of the people that you have hired, do they differ from the demographics of the founders? And so we're tracking behavioral change but also tracking the needs as they're attempting to adopt diversity and inclusion like into their startup. So interesting. So yeah. program managers, mm-hmm. which there's thousands and thousands yeah. of them, maybe tens of thousands of them out there, right? Yep. I feel like there's a new accelerator incubator kind of forming every day. You've got the notable ones like the tech stars. Yep. Um, anybody else besides program managers? Uh, like, So we have one next week 
This week. We have one this week <laughs> at a we work in New York. Okay. So like um, co-working. Yeah, yeah. So co-working spaces. We've done them at university, like entrepreneurship programs. Okay. Uh, so coming into the university. Entrepreneurship innovation yep. hubs at universities. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Which are becoming like more and more. More and more common. Awesome. Thankfully. I, yeah, I can't imagine how powerful it must be to understand the world of entrepreneurship, you know, right out of school. Yeah. Like I, you know, I'm like jealous. Jump in. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully we'll throw you a life raft. Uh, oof, goodness. <laughs> but it's like that's at that age, it's like that's when you can be the most risky and True. have the biggest ideas. And True. I, I'm excited to see what, what comes of that in the world. But uh, yeah, so I mean, so entrepreneurship community, you know, broadly speaking, we're open to coming in. We've worked with, uh, directly with VCs where we're coming in and just, you know, presenting to all of the companies that they invest in Interesting. As so well. like their portfolio companies yep. and making sure that they drive that home, yep. um, which I would imagine is probably not a hard sell. No. For the VCs, right? Um, well, and it, it sends the message that they right, care about right. it, which allows the founders to know that they can to also prioritize Absolutely. it. And that's that's a very powerful message. Yeah, I think you said it. I mean, it's prioritizing it, right? Yeah. It's like, um, and coming from the people that they took the investment from, they kind of have to listen, right? Right. You hope so. Yeah. <laughs> the right founders, yes. <laughs> um, anyone else that you guys are targeting or um, that should know about what you're doing at Alaria? I think that's that's pretty much the the group. It's, you know, individual founders, but also the communities that are supporting them. Okay. Excellent. Um, so um, what's what's next? What, what is your current role there? I know um, you're the co-founder and COO, but what's next for Alaria? Yeah. So all of these programs that we're talking about around entrepreneurship are really at the nonprofit, uh, which I am a co-founder in and I'm on the board. Um, and occasionally, you know, get my hands in some of the projects. But my primary role is COO at the for-profit at Alaria. And so what we're developing on that side is really tools to help companies track what's going on in terms of inclusion in their organization. And so our primary, um, you know, solution at this point is we come into organizations and offer what we call an inclusion assessment. So it's a bit of like s software supported consulting, you know, if I okay. may, like we're coming okay. in, we're providing a workshop. We're you doing need the hands on stuff. Yeah, you it's really not do all a tech tool, right? As of today, there's no way that these technologies would survive or drive the impact they need without the initial education. Yeah. Uh, and, and understanding, right. It's like, we have to kind of facilitate getting everyone to prioritize internally and realizing that it's not one person's job, but that it is everyone's job. Uh, so we're coming in and providing this initial workshop, doing some design thinking, um, sometimes doing surveys or some analysis, collecting data, trying to understand what's going on in the uh, organization on a day-to-day -day basis and how that differs for individuals within the organization based on their demographics, based on their role, based on their location, all of these things. And then so going forward, the solution really looks like giving them a tool to be able to track what we call incidents of exclusion. So allowing employees to self-identify when they they witness or when they experience something that is causing someone to feel excluded on a day-to-day -day basis and allowing that constant um, input to guide decisions for the company in terms of where they invest their resources and time in terms of driving greater inclusion. Yeah. And so we're developing that tool. Um, we have software simulations that help companies understand the potential outcomes of their investments and their resources. So we can say, you know, potentially, you know, play the simulation out a hundred times and we can say, maybe we can drive this much revenue or this, we can increase retention by this amount by doing these different things. And okay. so, um, that's kind of the space we play in from a technology perspective. And I'm kind of focused on further developing that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so then are you, you are national. Um, are you then moving back to Chicago and setting up efforts here as well? So our companies are technically based in New York. Okay. So I've always worked remote. <laughs> I've okay. always been okay. a little separated. Uh, so I'm in New York uh, once a month or so just to, you know, meet face to face with our team. Uh, but my work, yeah, it's definitely I'll be networking in here in Chicago to try to get in front of um, companies that have questions around diversity and inclusion or entrepreneurs that can help support our research. Uh, but I'll also, you know, quickly hop on a plane and be anywhere else just as well. Yeah. 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 Um, one last point on that. How sure. did you meet your co-founder? And it sounds like you guys work together pretty well. Yeah, it's a great balance. Um, it's, I got lucky again. I think that's just <laughs> the reality is like timing and luck plays into everything, right? So I came back from that Moving Worlds um, experience in Rwanda that I mentioned okay. earlier. Yep. 
and knew that I wanted to figure out what I could do uh, that would drive social impact, like what, what exactly that looked like. And so in my mind, I assumed that meant that I would be doing some self-reflection on what company I was starting next. Yep. But at the same time, I wanted to find something that I could do on the side until I figured out what that was. And so I was uh, actually looking at a job board that work um, W E R K used to um, manage. I think okay. they shut down the job board. Now they just do research. They're a phenomenal company, but um, they had this. It was focused on um, jobs that offer certain levels of flexibility. And so I was like, perfect. I'm going to look for a job where I can work remote, maybe part time or like random hours. That way, when I figure out what this big business that I'm going to create next is, I'll, I can you know figure that out at the same time. And he happened to be looking for a product manager to build a product, you know, to kind of bring. Uh, these methodologies and this research to life in a solution. Yeah, uh, We hit it off right away. We had a quick call and he basically told me, it's really funny. Uh, he said, you know, I've already got three candidates lined up, um, but I'd love to just meet you anyway. Cause sounds like we, you know, would get along. We ended up talking for like two hours and he's like, actually this hasn't been the interview. And I didn't think I was actually interviewing you, but can we set up an interview again? And we talked for two more hours. Um, that was like maybe the Thursday and the Monday. Keep in mind, I had strep throat at this time. <laughs> I was like running a fever the whole time. Uh, but we just hit it off and, you know, uh, realized that I could do a lot for this organization beyond just product. Um, and that I was truly passionate about it and, uh, came on board to help build the product and then, you know, kind of scaled and grew within the company pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, congrats. Um, yeah. and you know, congrats on what you're doing too. Thank you. Um, it's, it's huge in the space. Um, I haven't heard of any other organizations trying to do what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's big. So, um, thanks for sharing the story, uh, first it. and foremost. And, yeah. um, thanks for being a badass woman, founder, and <laughs> businesswoman. Um, and, um, really you've, you've, you've changed a lot, I think, um, and set the path forward for a lot of women, um, at least in Chicago land that yeah. you know I'm aware of. Yeah, um, thank you. So keep uh, keep kicking ass. That's, That's the awesome. plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so okay, so we talked a lot about uh, DEI um, and just how it relates to your current role. Um, again, very interesting. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, congratulations, by the way, on the uh, Kaufman Grant. Thank you. The Minority Business Development Agency Grant. Thank um, you. That's huge to it get is. those two networks to support you guys. Um, and you know, I think it's just important to note to, um, program managers, right? Like that's the target, any program managers out there, accelerators, incubators, co-working spaces. Um, Lisa is your person, right? Yeah. Valeria is your company. I would love um, to pro like come in and provide a free workshop. I yeah. mean, it's, it's that simple. It's, and, and, you know, I think, uh, one of the things that you said that was really resonated for me is just starting at the top, starting at the yeah. founder level. Um, you know, fish rots from the head as Jack Welsh says, right? So, yeah. um, you have to make sure that it's coming from the top and funneled down through, uh, the staff and, yeah. and your mission. So, and by getting founders to adopt these ideas now, you know, these are the business leaders of tomorrow. So, right. you know, hopefully we're driving a huge change, you know, come 10, 15 years yeah. when we're looking at these large, you know, publicly traded businesses that truly invest in and, and prioritize inclusion. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, such a cool thing that you're doing. Thank you. Um, Thanks again for coming in today. How can people find you? Yeah, you're welcome to check out our website, alaria.tech. If you're interested in the research, it's alariaresearch.org. Spelled and just like it sounds. A-L-E-R-I-A. -E okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check us out there. We're on all the social medias and you can shoot me a message directly as well. That'd be great. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming in today. Appreciate you. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to having you back in Chicago. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Thanks. All right. Thanks. You're listening to The Ecosystem, where we talk with the world's most exceptional entrepreneurs, investors, and emerging growth companies who are all making a difference in the world. This is your host, RJ Prahura, with our special guest today, Lisa Mago. For more information, go to fundecosystem.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, folks. <laughs>